Space Ants is a short story serial featuring everyone's favorite insects as extremophiles living amongst the ring system of a gas giant. This is the first segment, Space Ants, Never Say Die, an original composition by Eric Kay. They had five, maybe six more orbits before the colony was done for. None knew for sure, but the swarm collectively understood it. It was in the way the old queen stopped laying eggs and cannibalized her overpositor in the stale, thin airs, slowly putrefying scent. The colony had been kicked so far down, they had only a thin silk strand of hope left. Any dead weight had already been jettisoned to secure these last few orbits. Stiggy knew it, mostly by the lack of his peers, when he swept his antenna over other ants, but did not meet any more like him. He was the last scout. All others were workers, save for maybe a dozen warriors. They were close to doom, but space ants never say die. A signaler ant came to him. Seek and capture, anything, the dancing antennas communicated. He was being sent out, but was not deterred. It was a scout ant's job. There was the exit, an airlock held by the massive door ant, and he waited to exit. Around him, he felt one warrior ant, and then two weavers. They squeezed into the small space. Then they sucked in as much air as they could in their carapace. The door ant closed the room behind them. Then it lifted its massive, flat head. Out Stiggy went into the black vast of space and scurried around the colony rock to the jump point. There he saw it, one rock off into the distance. The sighters had been correct. It was a small rock, bad in that it might be hard to hit, but good because it would be uninhabited. But bad again because a small rock would not have much momentum. They needed something massive, preferably iron, to boost their colony into a safer orbit. They could use ice for momentum, but only in a pinch. Stiggy tracked the prize. It was small, but silvery. Water ice or metal. Regardless, the colony was past the safe point. They would soon be burned up in their gas giant's cloud tops. He positioned his muscular hind legs as two weavers wrapped a coil of silk around his bulbous posterior, the gaster. He crouched like a set spring and eyed the object. Ready. A weaver communicated via tap command. Behind them, small meteorites burned as they fell into the gas giant, never to be seen again. Perhaps radiotrophic life would grow in the atmosphere of the gas giant, and their colony's extinction a mere blip on life's eventual roadmap. Such issues were too large for space ants to concern themselves, but they would not die. Not this day, not this orbit. Stiggy, the space ant, would nail this jump. The silvery thing approached. He sat patiently, and his back legs twitched. He could make it. His legs triggered, and he shot up. Stiggy was born to soar. He flew through the vacuum toward his colony's last hope. Halfway, he flipped, and now his sturdy legs faced the prize. He saw the enormous striped crescent which dominated their lives. His colony was on the innermost edge of the ring, around their gas giant. Once, their planet had been a verdant moon before it drifted. Gravity had stolen the atmosphere slowly. The largest creatures died, then the small, and only the ants adapted to space. But Stiggy and the space ants did not comprehend. The colony knew by instinct that inward was death, and outwards was life. Always jump out, never give in, climb orbits, raw inherent knowledge. The gas giant had immense rings of glistening material, which they could have if only they jumped for it. He looked behind, almost there. As he landed, the space ant would feel instantly whether it was hollow, or ice, or metal, by the amount it recoiled from the landing. Stiggy hit with a muffled thump, a solid metal asteroid. With all his might, claws, spurs, legs, and the innumerable hairs, he fastened to any fissure found, trying not to bounce back off into space. He could tell by the lack of momentum he transferred. It was huge. They'd leech enough impetus for another few orbits. Now the problem was different. Far too much momentum. It was heavy metal versus insect silk. He felt the vibration of the weavers as they braided up new lines towards him. Tension on the line increased. Being pulled off was an acceptable situation. He could make another attempt, but if the silk snapped, that would mean an untethered jump. But every moment's delay was another closer to the colony's fiery death. They braided other silk lines furiously. The silver cord tensed even more as they ran. Abandon the prize and doom the colony? Or hold on for a few moments longer? Stiggy had no choice. Anything for another orbit. It wasn't until the weavers got three-quarths the way to the massive rock when he felt safe. The silk held. 
Weavers ran over Stiggy and split into different directions. The thin strand of his colony's salvation stretched, then slackened. He loosened his grip as the weavers went around three more times. The weavers then headed back down the line, braiding a fourth and fifth cord back home. It was mostly a momentum catch. Some workers would gnaw on the iron-rich rock. They would then feed it to metal-reducing microorganisms, whose biology did not need precious oxygen for energy. Later, when the bacteria grew a thick mat, workers could harvest it. Nothing went to waste, and they exploited every edge case of extremophile chemistry. Life would consume the inert, and it would never stop. It would wrest every free electron by any miracle possible. Life's solemn job is always everywhere to reverse entropy. Stiggy waited until the weavers had finished and returned to the colony rock. He passed the line gently through his mandibles, and once home, gave it a little tug. The line slowly became slack, and the ferrous iron hulk floated homeward. His body felt tense as the carbon dioxide built up. Though his exoskeleton protected him from the vacuum, he was slowly suffocating. Nor were the bands of radiation healthy for him. But he did not know what that was. He only knew of the instinct to return to the nest. He scurried swiftly to the door ant. Stiggy saw its bulbous blocky head where the weavers had previously entered. He arrived and tapped on the head, but it did not open. Open. His antenna demanded. Wait! The door ant communicated back. It was cycling a few workers out to help haul the prize. Stiggy waited in the black as his location drifted behind the colony rock's shadow. The gas giant was a slivered mottled crescent. Soon, there would be darkness as their colony rock drifted into shadow. Space ant colonies always kicked off in the night of their eclipsing gas giant. It was an evolutionary countermeasure developed to deceive predatory colonies by hiding a new trajectory. The door ant finally opened, workers scuttled out, and Stiggy entered. The head closed, and he exhaled all his stale air, and a panic set in as he breathed the same bad air back in. Then the butt of the door ant opened and Stiggy ran out. Inside, he hyperventilated on the thin oxygenated air and finally felt refreshed. Stiggy marched into the aphid chamber and milked one for its honeydew. The sugar was a splendid treat. Better than the bacterial mats, or the fungi, or even pieces of other ants. Syrup was splendid. After his allotment, he left the chamber and recovered in a small hutch. There had been other jumps recently, mostly for water ice. Most of their water went to their cast of greenhouse ants, who protected cyanobacteria in their bulbous, transparent abdomens. They hung through large holes, and there they lived their entire lives, immobile with their heads stuck in the darkness of the hive. Their bodies grew thick petioles to pass oxygen and sugars to the colony, meanwhile ferrying carbon dioxide and water to the algae. Though the apex creature, the ants were not strictly predatory. They could kill the aphids and eat them, but that was not their way of life, nor even life's overarching way. Their colonies had saved others from extinction and all benefited. This was the way of life, mutualism. The ants were the fittest, but their survival was not theirs alone. The space ants were the organizers and the stubborn shepherds who refused to die though their planet had broken apart. It was they who allowed life to get a new lease in the black airless void of the rings, allowing life to flagrantly disregard hard physics' cruel hand. Though their moon had died, they were still alive. Entropy tries to disorder, but life fights back until it has reorganized the entire universe into something alive. Darkness approached. Stiggy, the few remaining warriors, and a dozen workers cycled out through the last living airlock ant and into the dimness. Darkness fell over them as they crouched. Their back legs were all locked against the metal, it grew instantly cold. Workers cut and consumed the silk around the rock, while still others tried their best to scrape off any volatiles which had condensed on the cooling metal. Everything suddenly appeared slate black, as the ring set behind the enormous planet which engulfed their field of view. Faint crescents of light shined dimly through the thin upper atmosphere of their gas giant, and it was all that could be seen. Then the signalers, with their long antenna touching everyone, gave the order. Push. All legs fired at once and pushed the iron off below and behind them. Their colony rock now gained more momentum. They had escaped certain death. For now, all walked back inside, save for two or three watchers, big-eyed ants which spied for any signs of danger. 
Stiggy crawled back inside and fell into a deep rest. In the night, a signaler ant activated his antennae, and Stiggy had dreams of leaping and soaring through space. Dreams were times for new lessons from other ants, though he was the only scout ant left. This time, though, the signaler was not there to give, but to borrow his expertise. Jumps and landings, danger and searching. Biting and fighting. The dream ant would harvest those memories and transfer them into the last crop of scouts, which would soon emerge from their eggs. Life's energy margin was too thin to waste wisdom. The colony's rock floated safely through the black shadow. No ant jumped at night. The colony's activity died down to conserve oxygen. Watchers surveyed the colony's position from the scattered light. They were certainly in a higher orbit, but none knew for how long, nor if there were now nearby neighbours. But the darkness's safety was all too short for the colony. Stiggy was awoken by the beating of many legs, all striking to rouse every ant with one message. Alarm! It was dawn, and the watchers saw something hurtling toward them. Stiggy ran through the tunnels to the nearest door ant. He smelled the scent in the air and received the slimmest of information from the antenna of others. General fear. A raid. Out of the lock, he stood leg to leg with his warrior brethren. They swarmed to one side of the colony rock, prepared to fight to the death. There, floating not more than a few body lengths away, was a free rock. No enemy space ant was seen, and the rock was tumbling over two axes in their direction. It was a chaotic, uneven spin which spoke, unoccupied, so close that Stiggy felt no fear of jumping untethered. Still, the weavers wrapped one strand around him. Stiggy eyed the prize. It was longer than it was wider, and he aimed for the center, where the rotations were the least. He leaped and snagged it with his powerful claws. The spin coiled his silk around it, a rock to wind a string around, it tightening up naturally. Workers came up the line, but Stiggy stood still, trying to listen for any vibrations from inside the rock. All seemed dead. If this was another colony, he'd be swarmed over already. Workers finished tying up the stone. The captured asteroid was huge, easily twice the length of their colony's rock, but far too light, as though it were completely hollow. The thin string continued to wind up both rocks and imparted an odd little rotation to the colony. Stiggy crawled over the rock, searching for an entrance. There he found a dead door ant, which was clenched shut in rigor mortis. Stiggy's silently posture communicated back to the others, and two warriors came over. They all ran their antennae over the big dead head, confirming it was actually dead, and they tried to lift the skeletal remains. Door ants are such that in death, both ends will tightly clench the lock closed, the head lifted. Since two warriors together could not fit, Stiggy and one warrior entered first. The dead head dropped, then they pushed the abdomen. Inside, heavy in the thin air, was the stink of death. A grave, he tried to tap out to the warrior ant. It was cold, and there were no hostile vibrations. The air was stale and too thin to ever breathe well. Stiggy detected no pressure changes, like if a large body were running towards him. Nothing. Dead. The other warrior cycled through, and they began their exploration. Up walls and over floors. They searched through wide spiral tunnels, often catching only the fresh scents of each other at intersections. They cleared the long tubes which contained only the empty dead. They found no surprises. The exoskeletons of the dead had already picked clean, as if some other colony had long ago cast off this refuse for a higher orbit. Stiggy made it to a large chamber, which seemed once to have been a nesting hall. He saw a strange red glow. The walls were splattered with bioluminescent fungi, and the still fungus carpeted a bump in the centre of the chamber. These fungi often grew on the outside of colonies, feeding directly from their gas giant's radiation band, but here they were seen inside a room. Stiggy did not have the intellect to comprehend. He wasn't an exobiologist. But he had enough instinct to sense the strangeness. But without any ideas, he instead rifled through desiccated exoskeletons of long-dead ants from this unrelated colony, looking for anything to scavenge. Hollowed exoskeletons slowly floated, as the exterior workers finally halted the rock's spin. In the centre of the chamber, Stiggy burrowed through the fungal mat and found a strange rock. It was warm, and his compound eyes could see an ultraviolet glow. He tapped his antennae on it, then picked it up. It was heavy and dense, and he knew, at the very least, it would be worthy of momentum. 
The rock stayed warm, and he was forced to drop it at the dead door ant. It floated ahead and gently ricocheted off the wall. By now, he heard other workers at the door. Take your last breath, a worker's antenna said as it danced over Stiggy's head. He tapped back in the affirmative. Stiggy took as deep of a breath as he could, then helped the worker dismember the door ant. They grabbed on the joint between the petiole and the gaster and squeezed it between his mandible jaws. He could feel the crunch shake his body and then a pop. The gaster detached freely with Stiggy still holding it. He felt a brief hiss of air escaping as workers finally pried off the head of the door. Holding himself and the meaty prize steady, he felt the strange warmth of the dense rock under him. Many of the smaller workers crawled inside the abdomen, pulling out any glands, intestines and other organs. The colony would eat well tonight. With the abdomen exoskeleton emptied of flesh, Stiggy tried to move it out from the cramped tunnel. The hot, dense rock was pushed backward. Stiggy shoved the abdomen forward, trying to find a split in the tunnel to place it aside, and then grabbed the heavy rock. He turned his head to the right, but the hot rock did too. He pushed, pushed gain, then felt something give. Stiggy probed at the exoskeleton with his antennae, then realized he wedged the hot rock inside. Briefly, he thought of cutting the exoskeleton off his prize rock, but instead brought the entire abdomen with hot rock inside, back to the colony. He needed a new breath, and moments were passing quickly. He crawled through the newly cut hole and back home. Tie up. Stiggy communicated with a worker. At next darkness, they could kick it off into space and gain a quanta of momentum. Until then, it would remain tethered at the rear of their home rock. The last of the ants hatched. New scouts, workers, and warriors. Only one egg remained. The old queen chittered around it. It was her glory. A royal egg. The egg of the new queen. One which could stay in stasis indefinitely. It was covered in an insect jelly to nourish it wherever it may fall. Embedded inside was the menagerie of other species. Aphid eggs, bacteria, and spores of their fungal breeds. Everything. And all caked with gelatinized starches, needed to feed the new colony whenever it receded. But higher orbits, though different in their dangers than lower ones, are not intrinsically safer. Danger still remains. Stiggy was jolted awake by the thunderous sound of many synchronized feet. Alarm, a worker ant said as it climbed over Stiggy and up through the tunnel. Stiggy marched too, and up to the remaining door ant. Around him, on many sides and surfaces of the tunnels, he assembled with his brethren. He waited his turn and found himself pushed into the lock with two pupa scouts, still white from youth, and a weaver. They were crammed in, with legs and antenna shoved into every space. Raid, one antenna said with great difficulty. The airlock ant lifted its head and disgorged them from the black confines. They crawled up and around and took up defensive positions. Above them was a massive networked amalgamation of rocks held together by the thick webs of silk. A mega colony. Two, four, six, unknown. More sections than they had legs, it was past the number Stiggy could grasp. He was no mathematician after all. The weavers quickly attached silk lines to the scouts and tethered the other ends to their colony rock. A pair of warriors cycled out of the lock and took up a position at the nadir between them and the colony above. They looked up at the enemy. For a moment, their colony cast a tiny shadow on the enemy city. They saw a huge central mass, with many smaller sections slowly descending like claws. It was hopeless. Their colony's diminutive situation meant certain death, but space ants never say die. They fight for queen and colony until the harsh, empty blackness overtakes them. They hadn't escaped a planetary apocalypse to quit now. Into battle, their instincts commanded. Stiggy and the pupae jumped. It was a numbers game for sure, but there was also room for cunning if they struck quickly. The three landed, and their arrival shook a tiny outpost rock on the mega colony's periphery. Down the enemy's silk line, a signal vibrated. Disturbances. Immediately, enemy warriors emerged from the center and skitter over the braided line. Stiggy could feel enemies on the move, coming fast, as he placed his sharp mandibles on the other end of the enemy silk line. Slicing and sawing, he severed the silk, sending two enemies snapping back home. Perhaps they got flipped off into the achromatic death of an off-plane trajectory to suffocate in the blackness. Perhaps they lived and found a way back into battle. 
there was no time or capacity to ponder that. With the small rock in their control, the scouts ran back over their newly laid thin line the weavers had built up. Stiggy and the scouts tugged as firmly as they dared to alter their home's trajectory away from the slowly encroaching enemy behemoth. It was all guesswork for sure. Ants attempting to fly loosely tethered asteroids with silk string is as random as imagined. By the time the three scouts returned to their home, they could see the assault bridge forming. A chain of enemy ants was coming. One by one, their workers interlocked to span the void. The living bridge grew. Dozens of enemy warriors twitched, waiting to storm the colony. Stiggy and his cast fell in next to their allies. Battles began with small skirmishes. A few enemy scouts dared to board prematurely, searching for weak spots, only for allied warriors to swarm them. A few were dismembered instantly as many mandibles tore through exoskeleton. The fortunate were flipped back off into space, only for them to try again if still tethered by safety silk. But Stiggy stayed in a position nearest to the landing point under the living siege bridge. He noticed their colony's trajectory had changed and now looked as though the distance was increasing. Hope? Perhaps the weavers had cut the line to the newly conquered rock, or the dumb luck of unplanned trajectories had caused them to drift away. Stiggy did not know. He was no orbital mechanic. He was made to scout and was ready to fight. What is, is and what was to come. Fate was finally here today. The gap narrowed. More enemy workers poured out of airlocks, and the bridge grew faster than their relative speed. The articulated structure wavered slightly in zero-g, but grew longer and stronger with each interlocked leg. Enemy warriors twitched when the distance became an easy leap. Down they jumped, twirling their antenna to control rotations. One, two, six, or more, and the clash began. Stiggy fought with his brothers and sisters. He tore into the tibia of the first warrior he could reach. One of his nearby scout pupae was flung off, perhaps still tethered, perhaps not. Stiggy's tiny mind could not contemplate. He was busy severing limbs while avoiding spurs, stings, and other jaws. He grabbed an enemy's femur and held it down as a warrior cut through its back. The exposed innards boiled off in the vacuum. Gore and the dead piled all around the colony rock. Air hissed from the sacks and trachea of the dead, propelling bodies haphazardly around the battle space. But more enemies rained down in the drop assault. A large enemy warrior landed on top of Stiggy, pinning him to the colony rock and then Stiggy was stung. He went limp. Allies wrestled with the enemy ant, who in his frantic final act of life kicked the paralyzed Stiggy off with the floating dead. The siege bridge was finished and hordes of enemies swarmed over. Their colony was done for. No hope for victory, nor room to escape. Only death awaits. Stiggy floated off, but the enemy had not delivered its poison correctly. In the silence, Stiggy regained control slowly. He wriggled his antennae, then felt the faintest percussion from his small silver safety cord. It went tight, and now he sailed back slowly, back towards his embattled colony. He rotated his limbs more to cancel the spin and face the battle. Down below, he could not distinguish friend from foe. It was a living carpet of struggle. Ants were writhing, sawing, pushing, and flinging others off the rock. An occasional body would float past him, trying to reach out desperately to not be cast off into space but he evaded them by tugging deliberately on his silver cord. Frantically, he coiled up the length of silk and headed back toward his colony rock. He landed amid the bulbous bodies of their greenhouse ants. Stiggy ran to the door ant. He was on the verge of panic, but knew he needed to get back to the queen. However, now the front line of enemy ants had already pushed the thinning phalanx of defenders away and into a small perimeter around him. Then he felt, or heard, the death whistle of lost air. Their door ant had been breached. He saw a broad head floating off into space and observed thin streams of fluids which sprayed out and instantly boiled off. And so Stiggy did what was brutally logical. He made a new hole. He bit and soared into the body of his colony's largest greenhouse ant. Its severed abdomen slowly jetted off as he now scratched, chewed, and clawed at the rock and foregut of the greenhouse ant and made a new hole into the colony. Stiggy pushed the rest of the dismembered greenhouse ant in and ran along the tunnel walls to the queen's chamber. She was alarmed and ready to kill. Whether it was the tapping of a signal 
or the faint pheromones in the airless space. The queen halted her anxiety. He went over to her. Overrun. Death. He seemed to say to the queen, flee. Final plan, she said back. Then she picked up her enveloped royal egg and gave it to Stiggy. It was covered in copious amounts of insect jelly in clear segmented nodules. A worker came with him and ported another large clutch of jelly pearls. Then the queen left her nesting chamber for the first and final time to fight to the death. Enemies were already in the colony and advancing to the chamber. The queen took up an entire tunnel's width, blocking the advance. There she bit and clawed the oncoming soldiers. Stiggy and the worker advanced back up the hole he had chewed. It had gone unnoticed amidst the heap of dead bodies stuck to the rock surface. Outside on the colony rock, fighting was almost over. Stiggy found himself in the center of the last few warriors, assembled at the colony's rear tip. He stuck the royal egg on top of the abdomen-sheathed hot rock. Around it, the worker packed in more jelly into every crevice inside the gutted abdomen. Finally, he chewed at the little silk tether holding Stiggy and the objects to the colony rock. With their strong legs, the last warriors and workers pushed Stiggy and the package forward and out, away from their defeated colony, off to where life might be easy, towards hope. Out was life, in was death, it was instinct. All was quiet for Stiggy. The vibrations of battle were gone, and he peacefully floated away. There was a beautiful immensity of bright specks in the black. His breath grew stale, but he thought he could make it to nightfall. He planned to kick off the hot rock and land on the nearest largest shard of water ice. Another chance for life, for a new colony to flourish among these middle rings. He readied himself for the final push. Then he noticed an off-center spin which required him to counter with all his limbs and antennae. When he looked down, he saw a thin stream of water, or steam, or whatever. Stiggy wasn't a rocket scientist, but knew when he was experiencing thrust. Then it stopped. He rearranged masses and pushed a jelly sphere into the top of the dead Dorant's abdomen, and in a few moments, there again was more thrust. By holding the rock abdomen in a certain way, he placed the thrust in line with his center of mass and it propelled them forward. It was a slow, steady power, easy for him to maneuver, and so he did. Slowly, outwards, an exodus to the outermost rim looked plausible. Out to the bejeweled, speckled orbits the Watchers had told him about a place far past the threat of falling back into their gas giant, where the ice was plentiful and enemies appeared few. Maybe they could fly past the rim to the large light, a silvery ice moon, a sphere of infinite water, and well past the Roche limit, where Ant did not need to rob Ant of water and momentum. But not this orbit, and not Stiggy. He looked one last time at that shining light then looked around him. Time was running out, the lack of air stressed him. He would soon panic. There was time for only one more push before he passed out. Ahead, he spied a beautiful silver-blue pearl. A mass of pure ice. He did not even need to make it to the ice moon. The new queen and colony would be fruitful here. Perhaps, once established, some future scout would make the jump to the fabled ice moon. He took the royal egg and the clutch of remaining insect jelly and kicked off the makeshift steam rocket towards the largest chunk of ice he could reach. He flipped around for the last time, and stuck the landing. Then he wedged the clutch into a partial cave, and pushed his claws, legs and hairs into every crevice, trying to secure the seed. His last image was the colony egg, secure in a beautiful place. Then all went black. This has been Space Ants, Never Say Die. An original composition by Eric Kay. This audio has been artificially narrated by Revoicer. Subscribe to my channel for more space ants and hit that like button. It makes the ants happy and helps the colony get through one more orbit. You don't want space ants to die, do you?